We're definitely in a little bit of the wilderness, aren't we? And we know that Lent is what that's what that's about. And it's about celebrating in preparation for celebrating for Easter, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years with the Israelites or going into the wilderness for 40 days with Jesus in preparation for ministry. And so we are on this 40-day journey in the wilderness, hopefully getting closer to God, drawing closer to God, maybe practicing some additional spiritual disciplines, maybe going through that, um, that sacred journal that has a Northumbrian daily office prayers, maybe doing your own prayer time or meditation time, maybe doing some prayer walks, whatever it is that you are doing during Lent, make sure that it is regular and it is intentional and it is an opportunity for you to draw closer to God. Last week we talked about the beginning of this journey, and I was comparing some of it to Canoeing the Mountains, the book um, by Todd Bolsinger, uh, Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory. We talked about how the territory in front of us, the, the faith terrain, if you will, that's in front of us is completely different than it was a generation ago. How a generation ago, the Christian community was very different. And in fact, if you didn't go to church on a Sunday, your boss would ask you, ask you on Monday morning why you weren't in church. That's not the kind of world that we live in today. It's not what you would experience. In fact, most of the time you go to work and if you talk about religion, you're in trouble. You, that's just a, a no-go topic, the same as politics. We talked about how the way forward means we have to adapt. We have to adapt to what is there. I don't know about you, but there are times in life that I just, I'm convinced that it's a little foggy. Have you ever stepped into one of those times in your life that was just foggy, cloudy, you're unsure where you were going. Maybe it just felt like there was a bunch of mountains in front of you that there was no way you could get through them. Whatever the obstacles of life, they were like imposing and right literally on top of you. I remember back to a season of my own where um, we'd just gotten started in life. Things were going well and um, we were out in Colorado, and I, I was managing a sporting goods store. Things were going great. Um, Jody had a good job. Uh, we had a home, our first home, and we thought we had settled in and found this community. We were part of a church, and in fact, we had been invited to start a praise and worship team and a brand new church service. That was going great. And then I was involved, getting involved with the youth ministry, and uh, I was actually asked to be an elder of the Presbyterian Church. That's a little different than an elder in the Methodist Church. I was asked to be a part of the administrative council, if you will, the leadership team of the church. Things were going well. We, we fit in and, and we had community. We had friends and we had jobs and things were going smoothly. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this, I felt like God was calling me to a new space. God was calling me to be a youth pastor. And by the way, uh, at this point in my life, I was... I was like, no way, God, uh-uh, not interested, not my gift, and I don't want anything to do with that. But have any of you ever tried to argue with God about these things? Uh, even telling God, God, I'm not gifted to do that. I know I'm not gifted to do that. I found out if you argue with God about this, you're going to be wrong every time. So that was the point where I began to get involved with that youth ministry. I began to uh, pray over and say, God, okay, fine, I'll, I'll give this a shot, but I don't know where it's going to lead us because, you know, we've got things going good here. And this was on top of this thing. Then it just so happens that the same church that we were at, that we felt comfortable in, a job opened up for the youth pastor. The youth pastor was leaving, going somewhere else, and I'm like, yes, God answered that prayer, and this is going to be an easy transition, just slide right in here. And I, I, I started to feel good about this, and all of a sudden, I just, it was like God like, said, no, no. Have you ever encountered one of those spaces where it's just like, well, then what in the heck do you want me to do, God? I mean, I feel like this is what you're calling me to do, and this is where you and there's a path right there, and that's, that's the easy road, and God just kept saying no. And it ended up being that God led us back a different course, changed denominations from Presbyterian to Methodist and uh, back to through a program called Tentmakers Youth Ministry. And some, God opened up some doors that I didn't expect at the time to lead us exactly where God wanted us to be. And I think sometimes that's true. There's times that we come up against major difficulty or mountains in our life 
And we're expected to take this huge step or leap of faith that takes us in a direction that we weren't planning, we weren't expecting, we weren't even that excited about. But once we take the step, we begin to see how God is doing something grander than we can understand. For Abram in this story, you, you know, we, we know Abram from the beginning. God says, you know, go follow me. I'll show you a land where I want you to be. And he, he does. He goes and he's faithful. And things are going fairly well for Abram. And, and we find out that through this process, God is blessing him and anointing him and comes and says, hey, I'm going to going to make you into a great nation. But can you hear his doubt in this? Can you hear his fear in this passage? What are you talking about, God? You're going to make me into a great nation? I don't even have a child. I don't have a son who can bear my name. I, 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 this, how are you going to make me into a great nation when you can't even give me a child? Have you ever encountered those situations where you feel like God's telling you something and there's a, a path out there somewhere God's leading you and yet you can't even take the first step. I'm sure for Abram at this point, it felt scary. It felt uncertain. There was a lot of doubt and fear that's going on in the midst of this. So God gives him some reassurance. And if you read the whole of that chapter that was there, you'll, you'll find out that God does give him reassurance. He, he kind of walks him through some things. How many of you have ever in life said, mm, um, I just want to know what tomorrow holds? <laughs> Hey, things are kind of tenuous at work right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job. I'm not sure if this or that. Or I just want to know what's going to happen. Or things are really stressful with my family, and this has happened, and that's happened. I'm not sure how, we're get, how are we going to get through this. I, don't, it, I just want to know. I don't think we always do want to know, by the way. I, and take, for example, what God goes on in this chapter to tell Abram. He says, hey, I'm going to bless you, and you will be your own child who will receive this blessing. But then he goes on and says, um, this is the way it's going to happen. Your family is going to be taken off to Egypt. They're going to be slaves there for 400 years. And then we'll bring them back. By the way, doesn't, I don't think he mentions in this part that, that you're going to wander around in the desert for 40 years trying to figure out what to eat and, and where exactly you're going because you doubt me in the process. But I'm going to bring you back to this land and bless you. So I think maybe we should be careful what we ask for. We don't always want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. But what we can do is we can trust and we can believe that the destination, the purpose, the plan that God has for us is good. In fact, as it says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God works all things together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Think about that. It reminds us that, that the plan or the vision or the purpose that God is calling us toward is good and God will bless us even if we don't understand the path that the journey is leading us through. We may not be able to see over the mountains that are in front of us, but we can believe the promise of that which is behind the mountains. In the book, Canoeing the Mountains, um, as a talk a little bit about Lewis and Clark. I can imagine Lewis and Clark standing on this Lemhi Pass, looking to the west, thinking that they were going to be able to use canoes to get to the Pacific, just, you know, nice and gentle canoeing out to the Pacific. And they look and they see mountains, miles and miles and miles of mountains, snow-covered mountains, and they knew that everything had to change. I can imagine their fear, their trepidation. I can imagine them saying, okay, this is good enough. Let's go back home now. This is not what I signed up for. But instead, they continued on pursuing the vision or the mission that they'd been called to. They had to leave behind their canoes. They had to adapt. They had to get horses. They literally had to walk off of the map. Think about that. When God calls you to go off of the map completely, when everything in your life is changed and you can't even use a map to know. How many of you gotten used to Google Maps? And it's like, oh, I want to go to here. And you'd punch it in. And, oh, yeah, it just takes me smooth right there. Beep. Jody won't go anywhere without turning on her Google Maps. Even though she's been there a hundred times, it's got, it's got to hit that and it, it, it makes sure she gets there. Imagine being Lewis and Clark, literally stepping off of anything and everywhere that has ever been mapped. You don't know where you're going. You don't have the terrain. You don't know the rivers. You don't know the mountains. You don't even know what foods are edible and what plants are edible or not. 
They had to navigate new terrain. They had to new, learn these new plants. They had to resource the communities that they were walking through. And they didn't do it on their own. They had to adapt. Now think of this. Army captains, or army captain, Lewis and Clark, they were to be equals. Not quite, but they were always acted as equals. Think about this. Lewis and Clark are now headed off of the map. They've created a culture and a core of discovery that is united in purpose and in vision, and they're all on board with this, but they knew they're going somewhere new, and so they recruit this trapper and this young girl. Sacagawea, 16 years old, with an infant. Can you imagine captains in the army who are looking for resources and how to navigate, how to move forward? Do you think the first person they're going to resource is a 16-year-old girl? You think that would require, require a little bit of humility? They had to take somebody who knew the culture, who knew the terrain, who knew the languages or the people groups. She was a great resource to them. She actually helped them find a plant root that helped them survive after coming through an area that, that they were without food and starving. She helped them find a pass to navigate that they never would have found otherwise and continued to be used after that. She helped them, actually one of the biggest things that she helped them do was to integrate with the new native cultures as they came in contact because every time they would come to a new community, that new community would see this young 16-year-old girl with infant and they would know that they were a peaceful party. They were not a war tribe or a war community. She brought peace with her in their presence. You see, the world in front of us looks completely different than the world behind us. And when you think about our faith culture, our faith culture is changing dramatically in front of us compared to what it is behind us. There's tension and there's factions and denominations. There's shootings in churches, mosques, and synagogues. There's no longer this sense of Christendom everywhere we turn where everybody is seeking God in Christian community. The statistics and trends are moving more and more towards people who are none or no affiliation with church or religious organizations or duns who have passed tense, moved out of churches. There's a sense of elitism or arrogance rather than humility, even in Christian communities. The truth is, when you think about it, we have mountains in front of us as a faith community. We have mountains in front of our families. The real trick is, how do we navigate? How do we navigate this new Christian culture with everything changing around us? What do we do to complete the mission, to fulfill our purpose? Today I'm going to tell you, first of all, follow Abraham's example. Number one, believe. Believe in the promise of God. Believe that there is something beyond the, the difficulties in life, the difficulties in faith. Believe that God is calling us beyond the mountains and has a promise for us, even if we can't see it, even if we can't understand it, that God is calling us. Believe. And then second, I challenge us to think like Lewis and Clark. I think each of us need to utilize and resource the community around us. We need to listen to those who have wisdom of our changing world. We need to invite youth into leadership in our churches. We need to listen to the voice of those who are familiar with what's going on and the changes that are present. The only way to navigate the future is to invite someone into the journey who understands it. 
this week I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to embody this message in a, in a specific way. I'm going to invite you to, to think about some of those things that are churning or the mountains that you feel are present in your own life. And I'm going to invite you to identify somebody that might have a different perspective. And I'm going to ask you to invite it, it, to identify them, not so that you can go out and have a conversation or dialogue or debate or, or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to invite you to, to enter into that relationship and go and listen. Listen to someone with a different perspective on whatever issue you want to listen to, whatever, it's, whatever your mountain is. Listen to their perspective with empathy and understanding and praying that God would be present and the Holy Spirit would begin to speak to you in a new way. Because I'll tell you what, nothing can get you through the mountains if you have got something so stuck in one side. It's only when you allow someone else to help navigate those mountains that you will ever find a way through. And I'll challenge you. I'll, I'll, the truth is, for most of us, it's uncomfortable. Most of us, we know where we stand. I'm not asking you to change. But I'm asking you, I'm inviting you into a deeper conversation so that we truly can be the body of Christ, the body of Christ that can love, can embrace, can welcome all people, whether they have this opinion or that opinion about whatever issue. But maybe also that we can invite a younger generation that would help lead us and guide us in what that path forward looks like. Brothers and sisters, here's the, here's the final good news. Your life and my life may never bring the church to the other side of those mountains, that mission that God has called us to, but we can be a faithful part of the journey. And on top of that, what we can know is, although we may never reach it, God's already there. The promise and the fulfillment of the mission has already been accomplished. So brothers and sisters, don't allow yourself to be entrenched. But instead, find someone to stand alongside. Find someone who can help you on the journey and find someone that you can help on the journey as well.